Yeah. Well, thanks very much, Stefan. Um, um, yeah, and uh, thanks for being so, so patient and listening to my talks. I know um, what I'm talking about is pre pretty far from, from topology and pretty far from what most people are, 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 are working on here. So, um, yeah, and I, th I think I must have given about like, 20 lectures at these FRG conferences over the years. Uh, which is great for me because like, I get to work out all, you know, it really helped me clarify various ideas about quantum field theory, but not sure how good it was for the audience. But um, anyway, this is the last one. <laughs> um, so last time, we talked, we I explained that these minimal twists of supersymmetric gauge theories have a nice uh, interpretation in terms of complex geometry. So today I'm going to focus on the n equals 1 theory. So that's, I'll just state the result for that. We saw that the twisted n equals 1 theory on a complex surface x is what I call the cotangent theory. to the moduli space of holomorphic G bundles on X. Um, so if you remember in the very- Can you say what holomorphic, what the cotangent theory to define yes. the space means? Um, yes, I, I, I was about to do that. So I'll say, so you remember like in the first lecture I was explaining that you can think of a classical field theory as given by a sheaf of Lie algebras with an invariant pairing. And here I just mean the sheaf of Lie algebras is two terms. One is the Lie algebra describing deformations of holomorphic G bundles and the cotangent direction is just the dual of that. So, so explicitly, Um, uh, the differential graded Lie algebra describing. So would it make sense to say it's the cotangent expression of the moduli deformation theory of Omar B. G. problem? In yeah. other words, it's a, you're describing the Lie algebra in terms of. Um, well, so what happens is if I take solutions of the equations of motion of this field theory, I find a shifted cotangent bundle of the space of holomorphic G bundles. Then that's what cotangent theory means. Exactly. So we, we take our holomorphic G bundles and we add on some other dual directions to make it into a field theory. Make sense? I mean, the moduli space of holomorphic G bundles has a cotangent space. Yes. And this is it. Shifted cotangent space. And the description of that cotangent space and all its structure is tantamount to this n equals 1 theory? Yes, exactly. That's exactly it. Because we said to give a field theory, it's like to give a space with a symplectic form of degree minus 1. That was the definition we used. So here, oh. our symplectic form is just the cotangent form. So, yeah, so if we write this out like really explicitly in terms of a sheaf of Lie algebras, So it's the sheaf of is 
um, so assigns to an open subset of x this differential graded Lie algebra. So we're working near a fixed holomorphic G bundle, and this is the adjoint bundle of Lie algebras. Okay, so omega two star is, is the dual in the appropriate sense of omega zero star, and this shift of one corresponds to that shift up there. Okay, so what I'd like to talk about today is um, talk about something about the quantum theory and try to prove prove a theorem about the structure of the factorization algebra of the quantum theory. Oh, oh I see. The, the deformation theory doesn't have this quadratic form, this pairing in it, but quantum field, classical field theories do. Exactly. So you have to add that. Exactly. Put it in right there. Yes, that's exactly right. OK, so, so the theorem, the first theorem, which kind of may, maybe won't make much sense to people right now, is that this theory admits a unique quantization on any surface X, complex surface, with canonical bundle, with trivialized canonical bundle. Um, and unique um, is, in a way, compatible with various natural symmetries. So just as an aside, we're mainly talking about the n equals 1 theory here. But the n equals 2 and 4 theories can be quantized on, on any surface. N equals 2, 4, D theories? No, sup, these theories with n equals 2 and 4 supersymmetry okay. can be quantized on any complex surface. Yeah, I seem to be uh, removing unnecessary words from my, my writing, like prepositions. And, um, OK, so how could we prove this such a statement? Firstly, and what does it mean? So well, I'll first tell you how we can prove it. So in all this story, the constructions of field theories are always by some kind of obstruction <coughs> theory. So um, the deformation obstruction complex controlling quantizations. This is just some totally general story, is I take cochains of, <coughs> of jets. So I'll say what I mean by this in a second. So this L arises as sheaf, a sheaf of sections of some vector bundle. And this is the dx 
DGLA of jets of sections. And so to show that there's a quantization, we need to compute some cohomology group like this. And the computation is that So the invariance of this complex under some natural symmetries is just 0, has no, no cohomology whatsoever. So there's some natural symmetries of the theory. So these are the ones appearing there. So there's a completely unique quantization. OK, so maybe the more interesting question is, what does this mean? What, what do, we, do I mean by quantize? By quantization. Well, Sorry, yeah. Ah, ah, excellent question. The symmetries are only defined using the trivialization of the column. I Maybe it will help if I write down the symmetries. I don't know. So the symmetries are, if I trivialize the canonical bundle, I can rewrite this. as the Dalbo complex of the coefficients in GP adjoins some parameter epsilon, where epsilon is of degree 1. And then there are some symmetries namely d by d epsilon, epsilon d by d epsilon. And then there's some little, little computation you do that kills everything. Okay, this, this is part of a more, more general story, which I don't have time to say properly, but it's kind of nice that um, if you take, suppose I take some sheaf of Lie algebras which has an even symplectic form, then I take the cotangent theory to that, that always has a, a cano canonical quantization. But this one might be obstructed. No, no, this one, completely unique. No, no obstructions. I mean, in this setting, it could have been. Oh, could, it could have been obstructed. If, if I did this on a surface which had non-trivial -tri canonical bundle, it would be obstructed. On, oh. on P2, this doesn't exist. OK, so what does it mean to quantize? So let's work on C2. So. Classically, we have a factorization algebra which assigns to an open subset U and C2 co chains of this DG Lie algebra taken in the, the topological sense. So I'll call this the classical observables of our field theory. Um, so, so this, this is the commutative factorization algebra. It has a Poisson bracket of degree one. The C star LLU means like bar construction applied to the Lie algebra? Yeah, like the Chevalier Algenberg cochain complex. So the exterior, exterior algebra of the dual. So at the quantum level, uh, so a quantization.
gives a factorization algebra helps Q of U over C adjoint power series in H bar, which, which deforms this. So I've already talked about this particular point in my you know, million lectures in this FOG several, several times about what, what does it mean to quantize a factorization algebra. So the deformation um, such that mod h bar squared, we have an equation Well, what you want to say is when you deform from commutative to associative, the Poisson bracket tells you how to deform. Similarly, there's a Poisson bracket here, and that tells us how to deform. You have this kind of equation that when we deform, um, the differential fails to be a derivation by a term given by the Poisson bracket. So this tells us in which direction we deform. OK. Of course, that, yeah, so strictly speaking, of course, these should be lifts of elements to find mod h bar. So don't worry too much about the details. Okay, so now, now, oh, I'm a, a, a factorization algebra. Yeah. So should I uh, should I remind people have they seen this definition enough times? Probably. I mean, we saw it in Ryan's talk, right? So. I think this is possibly the first talking given this subject without having to define it. If this is the case. Um, okay, so, well, unfortunately, I don't have very much interesting to say about this particular factorization algebra. So, so this is a factorization algebra on C2. Um, and because it came from a theory where it was built from the Dolbeau complex, with, and this has some extra kind of holomorphic property. Sorry, the, the quantum guy. So this implies it would lead, if we figure out what it is, it's a two dimensional analog. of a vertex algebra. OK, so as I said, I, this is some kind of complicated algebraic object, but I, I unfortunately have, don't have anything concrete to say about, about this. So is any, any questions? Or? What's the question? Uh, I was wondering if there are any, I see some puzzled faces, but what? are there any questions? No. Yes. Uh, yes. Okay, so if not, I'll, I'll move on to something a bit more concrete where we can actually say something about it. Uh -huh. 
So next, to lead us back to more familiar mathematics, what I'd like to do is consider a deformation of our theory, which is partly topological and partly holomorphic. So recall the Lie algebra describing our theory on C2 is the Dolbo complex of C2 with coefficients in G adjoint epsilon where epsilon is a parameter of degree one. And the differential is just the d bar operator. So what we're going to do is deform this by adding, say, epsilon d by dw. This is one of the coordinates to the differential. So. Z and W are coordinates. Okay. So. Okay, so this is the theory we're going to focus on for the rest of the talk and see it has some kind of fun uh, geometric properties. So, so this, theory, this theory also admits a unique yeah, natural you know, compatible with symmetries quantization. Um, okay. So whenever somebody gives you a quantum field theory like this, you know, it's, if it was somebody who wasn't me, he wouldn't describe it as a DG Lie algebra. But anyway, so the first thing you should try and do is to figure out how, what's the space of solutions to the Euler-Lagrange equations. So, well, this DG Lie algebra we've written down Differential d bar plus epsilon d by dw. This describes um, holomorphic g bundles on C2 with a flat connection. in the w direction. I mean, the, you know, if you think about it, it should be reasonably clear, all because what we've done, we've kind of added on part of the Duram differential to this operator. So if you think of the mark Artan equation, you'll see that the epsilon should be thought, thought of as giving a connection in, part, in one direction. So, maybe, you know. And another thing you should always try and do when somebody gives you a field theory is to say, let's compute the solutions of the equations in motion along a co-dimension one space, because this will be a synthetic manifold. So, call the phase space. Solutions to the Euler-Lagrange equations in co-dimension one will always give us 
some possibly infinite dimensional uh, symplectic manifold, or, or manifold in some broad sense, which is called a phase space. You take, the ger you take the germs of solutions. It's a differential equation. Just the germs of solutions. Exactly. So it's um, just up, up to at the level of power series. It's, it's the space of Cauchy data, I feel like. Yeah. Um, so in this case, let's, let's think. You know, let's take some compact manifold of dimension three and see if we can figure out what the solutions of the equations of motion are. So on, if I take S1, which I think of as being the complex direction across the two torus, here we saw it's holomorphic in some directions, locally constant in the, in the others. Well, we find What we find is, of course, holomorphic bundles with a flat connection in this direction. W directions. So another way to say this So equivalently, we find, well, what we find is flat bundles on the torus where instead of using G, we use the loop group. So, which is like some infinite dimensional symplectic manifold. So, at this point, it might be useful to compare with Chern Simons. So, in, in, or, in Chern Simons, you find that the phase space. on a surface sigma is the space of flat G bundles on sigma. So this gives us a way to think about, at least heuristically, what this theory is. So we should think of the R theory as behaving like Chern Simons theory for the loop group. So that was in the Lie, the Lie bracket. So when we encode things in terms of a Lie algebra, the quadratic part is the differential, and the interaction is the Lie bracket. So the bracket plus the inner product makes a cubic term. Exactly. I mean, that, that's how you write the Simon's theory. You start with the Lie algebra describing flat G bundles, and you construct the, the action using, by doing what you just said. OK. So this, this is just a heuristic. So, I mean, 
Now, so as I said, I wanted you know, to do some kind of computations with this object. This, but we, we know that Chern Simon's theory. Okay. Yeah? So, what would you have got had you not twisted, like, done this extra deformation? Just we would have. Well, we would have found germs of holomorphic. This is like, I should think of this inside C star cross. And we would have found germs of holomorphic bundles in this object, like the cotangent bundle to that, shifted cotangent. I'm sorry, no, no in codimension one. Like whenever we do a cotangent theory, the symplectic manifold we find is again a cotangent bundle. So here we would find this cotangent bundle to holomorphic bundles in this guy. What we find when we deform it is a twisted cotangent bundle. Okay, so, so everybody knows that Chern Simon's theory is somewhat controlled by the quantum group. So what I'd like to explain, some of the main, main point of my talk, is to explain um, this 4D theory you were considering. Well, we said it's kind of like Chern Simon's theory for the loop group. So you might guess it's controlled by something like the quantum loop group. So I want to explain a previous statement like that. Is, well, uh, also closely related. to certain infinite dimensional quantum groups. So, so to do this, we should kind of look in a bit more detail at what the factorization algebra describing this theory is. Well, so it gives us a factorization algebra on C2, cross C of Z, cross C of W. And because our equations in motion, we're saying it's a flat bundle in this direction and a holomorphic bundle in this direction, which is um, so, well, locally constant. in the w direction, and holomorphic in the z direction. Um, now, in, uh, in derived algebraic geometry 6, J Jacob shows that locally constant factorization algebras on or n are the same thing as en algebras. Whereas um, holomorphic factorization algebras on C. I mean, they're quasi isomorphic to E and algebras or something? Yeah, there's like an equivalence of infinity one categories. Yeah, so they're 
So for each z, you get an en algebra? Or? Yeah, e e2 algebra. Huh? An e2 algebra. So, it's so for each w? So yeah, for each. Of oh, each z. So yeah, so each point in one plane, we have an e2 algebra. And then there's also some structure in, from the other directions. So from the other direction, so because it's holomorphic, these are, well, essentially, this statement is not, not literally true, but they're kind of very closely related, uh, vertex algebras. Well, so what, what we find is, well, the, the, because it's, you know, every, things are translation invariant, so the E2 algebra I find, for every point in this plane, I look on the factorization algebra, what it does in the fiber above that. So every point in the, in the Z plane? Yeah. So for every point here, the factorization algebra on the fiber is an E2 algebra. But actually, they're all, they're all isomorphic. However, that the subtle part is that these two structures kind of fit together. So what we find so we find something like a, an E2 algebra. in vertex algebras. So maybe I um, this is a little bit in quotes because of this factorization algebras on C, which are holomorphic, are not quite the same as vertex algebras, but there's very closely very closely related. So the way you wrote it put the uh, vertex algebra in the so he wanted to say, shouldn't it be a vertex algebra and E2 algebras? But, well, some of the real, the, the, a good way to define what this means is to say, well, an E2 algebra is a factorization algebra on R2. This is a factorization algebra on C. So we have a factorization algebra on R2 cross C. Yeah. So I'm kind of defining my way out of it. But it's, I totally believe that these things can meet, but I, I wouldn't be able to prove it to you. OK, and, and any questions about this? So that E2 is living in the W plane now? Yeah, so exactly. So be, you know, I'll be, be a bit more concrete and see, see, see what you'll. So I'll, I will. I mean, would, would be this, this static shape of the Yes. Um, there's, there's certainly, this all takes place in the world of co-chain complexes. So, and the, when we say holomorphic, there's some kind of homotopy involved. But this would be the other way around. I mean, this would be a vertex algebra in chain complexes. Um, well, maybe I'll, I'll try write down what the structure is more, more precisely. <laughs> so. So for all disks D in the Z plane, we have an E2 algebra. Built from of observables on disk. I just cross it with any disk in the W direction. So the underlying cochain complex is Lie algebra cochains. So I, I've written it up here. So let's compute the cohomology of this Lie algebra when I replace C2 by a disk. I find, well, holomorphic functions on C2, which are constant 
in one direction. So it's here we find cochains on holomorphic functions on the disk tensor G. So these these are disks in these two planes. This? Yeah. Okay. Now, so let's call this this E two algebra. So in the this plane, quantum. Sorry, so I, of course, I should put in a h bar. So actually, there's some computation to check that the cochain complex doesn't change when we quantize. All that changes is the structure. So if I take the CZ plane, what do we, I mean, what's the structure of a factorization algebra? If I take two disks inside a bigger one, I get a map of E2 algebras And this is a map. Um, okay. So what I said is this is something like a vertex algebra. Why why you might think, well, what does that have to do with this? Well, this map varies holomorphically as I move these disks around. So for example, suppose I, I fix, let's draw, draw this again. If I fix D1, something around the center, and D2 is centered at some point Z, as I move this guy around, I get some holomorphic family of multiplications depending on the annulus. If you read a, a vertex algebra book, that's what they tell you a vertex algebra is. Um, Well, the, exactly. So the, the, I mean, the two structures are kind of stuck together. Okay. So, so it's, it has both structures. It has an E2 structure and a vertex structure. And they're all kind of compatible. And there's some higher homotopy coherences. You know. Well, unfortunately, the only way sure somebody cleverer than me could figure out a good way to say these higher homotopy coherences, the only way I know how to say it right now is, um, is that, we just, that we have a factorization algebra on C cross C. <laughs> So I have like 15 minutes left, so I haven't got to tell you about quantum groups yet. Okay, wait, wait, so you've sort of taken apart what it means to have a factorization algebra, sort of expressing all the interlocking higher homotopies between this vertex operator algebra and C2 algebra. 
Yeah, I've, I've kind of said the first bits of structure. What? I, I've like said the first few bits of the structure, right. but I don't really have the clean way to unlock everything, right. except to say it is a factorization algebra. It's the kind of thing like, you know, an E1 algebra in E1 algebras, in the appropriate homotopy sense, is an E2 algebra. But that's, that's not a trivial theorem. So that's the kind of thing that's kind of going on here. Like, if we had such a theorem like that, then, you know, everything would be clear, but I don't really know how to unpack things in this. It's just such a slick way. Okay, so to tell you... By E1 algebra, you kind of mean a Poisson algebra, not an associative No, 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 it's associative. Associative. Yeah, this is the classical theorem of, of Dunn, topology. Um, okay, so I'd like to tell you about how this relates to quantum groups. So to do that, I have to tell you that this E2 algebra we assigned to a disk already has, has a name in, in the literature. Well, this, this E2 algebra that we assigned to a disk, it's, it's an incarnation of, a, of the Yangian. There's something called the Yangian. Has anybody? Yangian. Yangian which was invented, invented by Drinfeld in the 1980s. And it plays a, an important role in integrable systems and things like this. I was supposed to be Yang's second Nobel Prize. Right? Yeah? His work in that. Was that the same Yang? I didn't know that. Brothers. Oh, they're... they're brothers. Ah. I don't know which one. Well, that's why there's a Yang-Yang equation. <laughs> I thought he just... Did, did, Wrote it twice. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, so so to get to the to get the, the Yangian, we have to recall something, which was um, I first learned from Dima Tamarkin, and he says that E two algebras and Hopf algebras are closely related. So Tima used this because he wanted to prove formality for the E2 operat, and he did this using a theorem of etting of Kashtan, which constructs Hopf algebras. So more precisely, so in E2 algebra, is equal to an E1 algebra in E1 algebras. And if we have an E1 algebra with an augmentation, we know that we can apply causal duality to get a co-E1 algebra. Some augmented E1 goes to co E1. Exactly. Um so let's apply this to one of these factors. So we apply causal duality to just one of these things. So we get, you see, we can turn an E2 algebra into an E1 algebra in co E1 algebras. Well, this is, is everybody, this is um, i.e. a bi algebra with some extra conditions. Um, 
we know hop algebras are basically the same thing as bi algebras. So with extra conditions. A bi algebra in the sense that the diagonal map is an algebra map? Yes, exactly. So the, yeah. Some extra hypothesis. This construction gives a Hopf algebra. OK, so let's, let's apply this construction to our example. Our E2 algebra. Um, associated to a formal disk. Yeah? Can you say what the hypotheses become when you look at them in, in e, E2 algebras? Or? I don't remember. Uh, Jacob, what are we? Uh, what, I, what properties do we need an E2 algebra to have so that when we do causal duality, it becomes a Hopf algebra instead of a bi algebra? Uh, none. none? You don't need anything? Oh, great. I thought. You need hypotheses if you want this to be able to reverse the process. Ah, good. Thank you. This is even better. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> what did you erase? Extra hypothesis. We don't need any. So, is an augmentation what you erased? No, we need an augmentation, need that. but that's all we need. Okay. What did you erase? Oh, I, 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 thought, I thought we needed extra hypothesis to oh, get a Hopf okay. algebra, but we don't. A biologist is either a Hopf algebra or not, but I mean, in this case, automatically is? Yes. That's what, okay. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sorry about that. As I, I should say, this is all kind of work in progress and haven't really pinned down every detail. I've done the key computation, but, uh, which is that it's. Ah. There's a, yes. Okay. <laughs> anyway, so we see we have, we have an E2 algebra associated to a formal disk. And this E2 algebra looks like cochains on G assign, assign, cochains on G adjoin a formal parameter adjoin h bar. So we apply causal duality We just take a limit in the Z direction. So applying causal duality, well, we know that cochains of a Lie algebra becomes a universal enveloping algebra. Some, some care is needed when it's semi-simple, but you know, say something about filtered things. So but applying causal duality, we find. Well, you already had applying to our E2 algebra associated. First you're applying C star and then we apply to No, no, no. I, 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 I clearly need lessons in English. Um, <coughs> the E2 algebra, so, oops, sorry, so did slip before. So the so formal disk is this cochains, and we apply causal duality, we find a Hopf algebra structure. Structure on the universal enveloping algebra, G adjoins Z, join H bar. Okay, I suspect the kind of punchline of this talk is something that means nothing to anybody. Is that? 
<laughs> the theorem. This is the Yangian. <laughs> Am I right? <laughs> I mean, I, I'm ignoring it too. Oh. Tell us about the mathematics. What was it? Yangian. Yangian is a universal enveloping algebra. It's it's a Hopf algebra structure on this universe, which deforms. Oh, it's a deform uh, structure. Like the quantum group. Yes, exactly. Deforming. So it's, it's a quantum group for half of the loop group. OK. So there's a couple of things this tells us. It's not co-associative. Uh, it is co-associative. It's associative and co-associative. It's, no, it's non-co-commutative. What? It's not co-commutative. Oh. oh. I was just but it's keeping associativity. Of the yes, exactly. Okay. Yeah. So. So this tells us two things. And this is, is co-associated in the naive sense or in some categorical sense? In the naive sense. Naive sense. Yeah. So I it, thought these quantum groups were non-co-associative deformations. No, you're you're you were right for if I take a finite quantum group. A finite dimensional, right? Yes, then then what you said is true. It's some associative but co-E2. And co-E2 is where all this trickiness comes in, because it's hard to pin down what that really means. But here, it's really E1, co-E1, no fanciness needed. So OK, this tells us two things. One, well, physicists apparently didn't know this, but observables of n equals 1 supersymmetric gauge theory so after a deformation some natural deformation contain the Yangian and actually I mean this is an example where there are almost no computations known about n equals 1 supersymmetric gauge theory. So I think this is a, a, a new computation. And secondly, if you're a mathematician, well, if you're a representation theorist, in fact, there, there are zero representation theorists in the audience. There are no representation theorists in the audience. <coughs> so the Yangian has this extra structure, which was not known before. Um, as well as being, um, let's see, how to say it, its linear dual is a vertex algebra. <laughs> so what does this mean? Another way to say it, if I look at modules for the Yangian, have, because it's a Hopf algebra, these have a, these a form a monoidal category. But from this vertex structure, they also form something like a vertex category. Which, you know, Something one can make sense of with work. And yeah, so modules for a hop algebra form a nodal category. So this is another way we could have said this in the E2 world. Left modules for an E2 algebra are an E1 category. So here we have something which is simultaneously vertex algebra and E2. I take modules, then I've removed in E1, and I am left with an E1 and vertex. That's why I'm 
why we have this structure. Um, yeah, there's other fun things along these lines. The module for vertex algebra is the module category. No, so, saying, saying modules for this Youngian, I just say it. So, I, I, I have this Youngian. Well, I can assign it to any disk. So I'm saying for every disk, I have a monoidal category. Then if I have two disks inside a bigger one, I get this functor of monoidal categories. So it's, it's something like a vertex algebra, values in monoidal categories. And again, and again there are these issues of how to really say this in the correct, coherent way. I must say I haven't, haven't really pinned down, but you know, the formal story says it should be clear. Um, OK, so maybe just to Taking these two two-dimensional concepts and forged your way up to four. Exactly. Considering a simple case where you're only going going in one direction. Exactly, yes. It's some there are two this is exactly right. There are two 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 D field theories kind of stuck together. You have a four D field theory. Um is there anything else to say? So maybe So let me briefly say, I'm just out of time. So this, this story associates, more generally, a Hopf algebra to any Riemann surface sigma with a nowhere vanishing holomorphic one form. The case we've, we've been discussing is a disk with dz. And then <coughs> conjecture for sigma being the punctured disk with the one form being dz over z, we get essentially up to issues of completion the quantum loop group. OK, so this would kind of be some justification for the statement that when we dimensionally reduce, we find chern simons theory for the loop group. That churn simons theory is supposed to be built from the quantum group. And here we see if we reduce, if we think of it along this particular Riemann surface, we find the quantum loop group. Um, Does that mean this Hopf algebra here or not? This quantum group? Yes, exactly. This is an elaboration. This is an elaboration where you, instead of taking a disk, you take a a general Riemann surface with the one form. Oh, oh, I see. Quantum group requires you to go beyond the, the disk. Yeah, because you have the whole, you have, the disk only sees the, the positive part, po positive series, and then the loop group, you want the positive and negative part, so you need a punctured disk. The correct form is dz over z. Hmm. Ah, OK, so I, there are various other fun things you can do, but I think I'll stop there. And maybe we should like thank the organizers for putting on a, a great conference. So that's Stefan. <laughs>